And now I am delighted to invite the Yemeni ambassador, His Excellency, Mr. Mohammed Al-Hadrami for the stage. The ambassador Al-Hadrami has served as the Yemeni ambassador for the uh, United States since earlier this year. Uh, before that, he served as a foreign minister of the Yemen, of Yemen government, Yemeni government for uh, last two or three years. And uh, the ambassador also is a uh, uh, long and distinguished career Yemeni diplomat from a diplomatic uh, corps since 2004. Previously, uh, the ambassador has uh, been in studying here in the United States where he graduated from Missouri State University as a bear for, uh, for four years, yes, uh, in 2002. After that, he joined the Yemeni diplomatic corps. And uh, the uh, ambassador uh, also had a master's degree from uh, uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University in Diplomacy and International Relations. Uh, please welcome the ambassador to the stage. Uh, thank you. Distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. It gives me really great pleasure to be with you here today for the first annual conference about Yemen organized by the Washington Center for uh, Yemeni Studies in collaboration with the Middle East Institute and the National Council in U.S. Arab Relations and the Gulf International Forum. I thank all the organizers for having us here today. And I am glad to see so many familiar faces and happy to meet new ones as well. So thank you for, for being here and thank you for having the time to discuss this very important issue. After eight years of war due to the Houthis coup, Yemen needs all the help it can get. And I hope that our discussions and deliberations here today will shed light on how we can collectively assist in finding a path to end this protracted war once and for all. Yemen is a beautiful country, and I'm sure those of you who had a chance to visit, it would attest to this fact. It has rich history, diverse and beautiful scenery, hospitable and welcoming people, and not to mention the great food, and we have a couple of good restaurants here for those who want references. Indeed, Yemenis deserve much better than what they're facing today. For more than eight years, Yemen has been engulfed in the world's worst humanitarian crisis and facing one of the toughest challenges in its contemporary history. Its economy is on the brink of collapse. More and more Yemenis face not only economic hardships, food shortages every day, but also a brutal campaign threatening our social cohesion as one nation. I know all of us here agree that this war must end and that a just and a sustainable peace in Yemen should be a priority for the international community as well as for the U.S. policymakers. And I am happy, truly happy, that we have a chance for all of us to demonstrate this today. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, if we look at the current situation in Yemen, we realize that things need to change if we are to achieve peace. And if we look and examine closely the facts on the ground throughout the years of the conflict, we also realize that if we keep doing what we're doing since the beginning of the war, the war will never end. It will drag on and on, and many millions of Yemenis will suffer the consequences. One may ask, and I was asked this before when I was here four years ago as a deputy chief of mission here in Washington, D.C., with all the help of the Saudi-led coalition and the support of the international community, including the most powerful nations, why have we, the Yemeni government, not been able to end the war? Why haven't we been able to force a group as radical and as hated as the Houthis are accept any peace? And the answer is twofold. One, we in the legitimate government and the coalition have not been able to unite as one in the face of this menace before April 2022. 
And two, the Houthis with the Iran's influence were and still are not ready for peace, at least not yet. Since the coup in September 2014 onwards, the infightings within the factions of the government on the one hand and the continuous support of Iran to the Houthis on the other have both made it possible for the Houthis not only to consolidate their grip over the capital city of Sana'a, but also to expand to other areas. So how can we then end the war? And one needs to change to achieve this objective. I wish I have simple answers for you, but I would explore some factors that would probably help light the way. First, the Presidential Leadership Council, PLC for short, needs all the support it can get to work as one. For the first time since the coup in 2014, all the factions within the government are now under one leadership. And maintaining this unity, in my opinion, is the best chance we got to end the war. The PLC has a tremendous responsibility. And no one expected its task to be easy to begin with. His Excellency President Rashad Al-Alimi has affirmed that the council is committed to working as one. Yes, there are many challenges, but they all agree for the need to have a unity of purpose. And that ending the coup and restating state institutions are its main objectives. However, the Presidential Leadership Council needs more help and support militarily, politically, and economically. And I say militarily because even though we believe there is no viable solution or military solution to end the war, we know for a fact that peace will not happen without a military pressure. Peace will not happen without having a plan B, especially when the Houthis keep thwarting all peace efforts as they're doing right now. Political support for the PLC at this juncture would mean returning to Aden, our temporary capital, and opening new embassies in Aden, especially by the coalitions, our friends and allies. The Houthis need to realize that Aden will get stronger and stronger before they would vouch for peace. And when I say economically, I mean it's by fulfilling the pledge of three plus billion US dollars promised in April 2022 by our brothers in the coalition. We thank the coalition, however, for all the support thus far. We would not have made it without their help, but we need to show the Houthis that what's to come is different than what had been in the past. This is the way. This is the only way if we are to see an end to this war. My second point is about the truce. The truce alone will not end the war. Even though the escalation is a good thing, unfortunately, a truce respected and absorbed by only the government will not produce a viable peace. The government accepted the truce, as the prime minister mentioned six months ago, to alleviate the suffering of Yemenis and to also try to force the Houthis to talk peace. However, after two extensions, we realize that only the government of Yemen is fulfilling its obligations, and not the Houthis. Only the government of Yemen is making concessions and more concessions with pressure from the international communities and our allies, but not the Houthis. The goal should not only be to extend a truce, it should rather be to use it as means to achieve a just and a sustainable peace. It should be this peace in which a viable democratic platform can be created upon which all Yemenis can freely choose their rulers, engage in genuine civic discourse to form a new social contracts for all Yemenis to have equal rights and responsibilities. We support the extension of the truce, ladies and gentlemen, but not just any truce, and not with the new conditions the Houthis have presented. We support a truce that delivers to all Yemenis, and that requires the Houthis to totally fulfill their obligations. And unfortunately, as we stand right now, even when I was talking yesterday to our colleagues, they're not doing it. We have opened Sana'a Airport for commercial flights, which is a good thing. It has been the view of the government for years. The Houthis now, for example, insist on using their illegitimate passports, which will basically compromise the integrity of all Yemeni passports. 
We have presented, for example, many options to solve this issue by issuing travel documents for all those people in Sana'a to travel and get new passports from Jordan, from any other destinations. But the Houthis refused. In Hudaydah, for example, we have allowed gas and oil ships to enter unchecked. And the Houthis never paid a penny for salaries despite all the revenues they're getting. Furthermore, they insist on not allowing the government to check ships' documentations and threaten merchants if they decided to comply. With the truce now, we have no ability to check whether these ships contain Iranian oil, for example. The Houthis have received free Iranian oil shipments according to the UN in the past. And all we're asking is to check the documentations. Is this too much to ask? In Taiz, for example, the poor government have been under siege since the beginning of the war, and the Houthis repeatedly refused to set it free. The UN envoy, in the course of just a few months, have presented more than three proposals to open roads in Taiz, and the Houthis rejected them all. The Taiz road issue, in my opinion, must be dealt with like we dealt with the Safir issue, the oil tanker issue was addressed. You know, for years, the Houthis hijacked the Safar oil tanker, which sets in, in Hudayda. And I think many of you know about this disaster. They used it as a bargaining chip in, um, f throughout the peace negotiations. And thankfully, this issue was detached from these issues after we formally asked that in a special session in the Security Council back in July 2020. And now funding from Netherlands, United States, Saudi Arabia, Germany, the UK, and others up to 75 million US dollars is secured for the first phase, which is the, the emergency phase. And I'm happy and I hope the UN will do its job and start saving Yemen from this catastrophe once and for all. So we need to deal with this issue, Taiz, like we dealt with Safar, in my opinion, to have it fixed and not just have it in the hands of the Houthis to play with it. Third, the Houthis war, in my opinion, should be viewed as part of the Iranian expansion project in the region. The Houthis and their backer, Iran, need to see strong messages from the international community and from the U.S. government and Congress, especially about the destabilizing behavior in the region, and in Yemen in particular. Make no mistake, without help, without the Iranian help and Hezbollah's expertise and weapons, the Houthis wouldn't have been able to do what they're doing right now. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate the level of support we see and we're getting from the US administrations and, and for the Presidential Leadership Council expressed by both President Biden and, and Secretary Blinken. And we really value the great work of our friends, the, UN, the US envoy, uh, Mr. Tim Linder King, who is speaking for you here today. And I hope that a stronger stance from Congress could be shown to expose Iran malign activities in Yemen and it be linked to any possible deal with Iran in the future. I think that would help Yemenis and will help us find a way. The Yemeni conflict can be solved. Yes, it is complex and it's getting more so as time passes by, but the more we wait, the more costly the solution gets. And without a holistic approach to deal with this conflict from all the main factors that I just mentioned above, the Yemeni conflict will prolong. And Yemenis will not be able to find a solution, I'm afraid. I wish our deliberations here today success, and I hope uh, this conference will enable us to find ways to pursue a just and sustainable solution to the Yemeni conflict so that Yemenis can once again be free and live to, proper, or to, to, uh, to, to prosper as one nation. I thank you all. Please give a warm welcome to the ambassador.